What's your research about? So my background is phenomenology, and I've started uh, to look at the connection between phenomenology and cognitive science. And I especially focus on embodied cognition and um, especially intersubjective uh, types of processes that concern embodiment. What is the prevalent model of cognition in cognitive science today? So there is a, a prevalent model of cognition in cognitive science today, and it's dominated for quite a while. It, it goes back to the origins of cognitive science uh, in the computational uh, context. So um, that is a model of uh, the mind, which involves computational processes, uh, representation. It's very much brain-centered. The, the phrase is in the head type of processes that uh, uh, basically locate the, the mind in the head or in the brain. And, uh, can, and the idea there is that one can explain everything you need to know about cognition in terms of brain processes. What is 4E cognition and how does it challenge the prevalent model? So 4E cognition, which stands for uh, embedded, uh, sorry, em embodied, embedded, inactive, and extended cognition. Um, the main message there is that cognition is not just in the head. It's something that involves uh, the body in, in general and also the situation of the body in the environment. So the unit of explanation is not just neuronal processes in the brain, but the, the whole complex of brain, body, environment, taken as a, as a whole or as something like a gestalt, where there are dynamical relations among those different elements that have to be uh, taken into account uh, if we want to get a, f a better concept of cognition. Could you say more about each of the four E's? Okay, so um, the four E's. So uh, the first is embodied, and that's a, that's a very uh, general kind of uh, classification of, of theory. Uh, embodied cognition, uh, you could say, goes back to um, someone like Merleau-Ponty in the phenomenological tradition. Uh, it's, it's something that's discussed by uh, Varela and uh, Thompson and Roche in their Embodied Mind book of 1991. Uh, and there's been a lot of work uh, just looking at how the body contributes to um, the actual cognitive processes. So. One good example of this uh, is, uh, is uh, the, the role of the hands, uh, for example, in cognition. And uh, I mentioned earlier in, the, uh, uh, in our workshop that uh, you, know, you could think of this in terms of, uh, if, if in evolutionary terms, if we did not have hands, uh, it, it would turn out that the brain would be very different. And we would probably have a very different conception of what rationality is. So the idea that uh, that the brain co-evolved with the body seems an important idea, and that if the brain is important in cognition, which of course is not denied by 4E cognition, but if the brain is important uh, in cognition, part of the explanation of that is because it is connected to, coupled with a body, and it has co-evolved with it. So embodied cognition uh, is an overall term that in probably includes uh, the other uh, terms, uh, which are embedded, inactive, and extended. So embedded uh, usually uh, refers to the fact that the body is in an environment, coupled to an environment in uh, important ways. That environment uh, is not just physical, it's also social. There are other people out there. And it's also cultural in the sense that we engage in various practices that uh, are often shaped by different kinds of things and, uh, uh, and buildings and uh, architectural features of the environment around us, uh, the landscape of the environment, you might say. Um, and that environment defines, helps to define different affordances, which means different possibilities of, for action. Um, so that that, the, that relationship to the environment seems very important as well for understanding cognition. The inactive aspect 
is this idea that um, we are uh, embodied and in the environment um, and that our primary relationship uh, between body and environment is really uh, geared towards action. Uh, the idea that we uh, are perceiving the environment in terms of what we can do uh, in regard to the things around us uh, is uh, again tied to this notion of affordance which comes from James Gibson's uh, work uh, in ecological psychology and uh, the fact that we are tuned in or attuned to the environment uh, in terms of practicality of what we can do uh, is very much part of this inactivist conception. And the final E uh, here, which may not be the final E, <laughs> because other people have said, oh, there are other things to add here, but uh, the notion of extended mind, uh, this is uh, something that develops out of uh, a uh, you know, theory of distributed cognition uh, and uh, also emphasizes the environment and makes very strong claims, uh, usually, about the, the role of instruments and objects and things in the environment uh, and how they constitute in a very strong way what cognition is. Uh, so extended mind uh, conceptions usually think of the, the processes of uh, using instruments or um, various objects in the environment uh, in, uh, very much as part of the vehicles of what cognition is. And playing a similar role to the role of neuronal processes in the brain. Uh, so, uh, the, the, philosophically speaking, it's based on a kind of functionless conception of how things uh, work in cognition. So, uh, as I said, there are people who also think, well, we should, we should talk about empathy. That's another E. Um, and empathy is about intersubjectivity, so that comes into play. Um, other people say it should be the four E's plus A, where A is affect, uh, and that uh, we don't speak enough about affective processes, which uh, embodied theorists think, well, that's, that's about the embodied, and uh, it's, embodiment is not just about action and body schematic motor control processes, but it's also about um, affective processes, uh, fatigue, hunger, those very basic things, uh, and as well as emotion. And, and such. Are they suggesting that affect is a form of cognition? That emotions are a form of knowing? There's a lot of uh, work on uh, affective cognition. <laughs> uh, so it goes back to um, someone like Damasio who says, look, you can't really talk about cognition as if it were divorced from affective factors or emotion. Uh, that in fact, a lot of motivation, a lot of interest, um, which shapes our perception of the environment, um, are uh, based upon these kind of affective factors. Uh, and these are embodied and one has to sort of work out how in fact they shape the way we perceive and think about things. Is meditating with others different from meditating alone? Yeah, that, that was the question I asked the Dalai Lama and I didn't get a response to it. Oh, he started to, to talk about um, teaching, uh, the, the importance of having a teacher for meditation practice, which I think you know, he picked up on uh, the notion uh, that intersubjectivity, I was trying to you know, say intersubjectivity is important, uh, and I put the question in terms of, kind of the, intersub the effects of intersubjectivity on meditation. And he picked up on the intersubjectivity idea, and he, he talked to, yes, indeed, you know, having a teacher you know, is, is important. But he didn't address the question of when we meditate together, when there's a group of people meditating, I wanted to know, is the experience itself different than the experience that I might have meditating by myself? Uh, so he didn't give me an answer to that. I thought that would be a nice thing to explore, but uh, in the end I thought, I don't, I don't know enough about meditation and not that there are studies uh, that show, uh, yeah, things are different if you do them by yourself versus by, uh, you know, with others around. Uh, and that, uh, that's the kind of thing I was looking for, but... Uh, Doesn't the fact of intersubjectivity contradict the belief that the mind is private? 
And there are still theorists who, who would say, you know, going on this kind of dominant cognitive, cognitivist model, that we can explain intersubjectivity uh, just by looking in the brain. And, you know, it's about, well, mirror neurons or something like that, or there's theory of mind areas of the brain that, you know, once we understand how they work, we, we get what we need. And that totally ignores the kind of interactive processes that happen when there's another person, you know, in the room with you or, or you're interacting with someone uh, and you're seeing them face to face. And a lot of people in science think, well, facial recognition, that, that's what we have to explain. And um, it's more than recognition. It's not like me just trying to identify who it is I'm speaking to. It's more like, oh, I'm engaged with the other person's face. You know, I'm seeing their, where they're looking and if they're looking at me, <laughs> that's not just me and my brain. It's, wow, something's, uh, something else is involved.